but now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Pastor Simon Cooper, uh, who's been pastor for 11 years. He's currently serving here uh, at Bethlehem, uh, has been for the past six years. Previously a school pastor at uh, Unity College at Murray Bridge. Uh, before that was an aged care chaplain at Hope Valley Lutheran Homes. He's married to Wendy, uh, who's a school teacher, and they have three children. Pastor Simon enjoys cooking, playing guitar, and outdoor sports. He soon to commence work uh, as a school pastor at Luther College in Croydon, in Victoria. Uh, on the notes he's given me, he's written Victoria in capital letters, so um, I'm not sure what that means, but um, Marlene's probably quite happy about that. Uh, and uh, also worked part-time as a Navy chaplain. Uh, previously, before entering the ministry, he uh, served in the Army as a cartographer uh, and was also a graphic artist. So please join me uh, in welcoming Pastor Simon Cooper. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. When we, were, when we were helping ourselves to soup, someone saw the PR, Simon Cooper, and, and they said, oh, I've been seeing a few of those, and at first I thought it was <laughs> Professor. And I've been feeling very proud ever since. We went down to the, the Louvre to look in the mirror. <laughs> I think I need some glasses to make myself look a bit more like a professor, but no, a pastor, a shepherd. And let me share with you some, some words from the Chief Shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, in the 10th chapter of John uh, is recorded as saying, well, we know that chapter uh, possibly very well, where Jesus says, I'm the Good Shepherd. But he also says other things in that chapter, things that often get overlooked because of the emphasis on the Good Shepherd theme in that chapter. John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus says... The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, 2,000 years have passed since our Lord Jesus spoke these words. That's a long time. And uh, I, I guess there'd be a lot of moderns who would look back at the ancients and say, okay, that's all very quaint, all very nice. But what would an itinerant teacher from Nazareth, uh, a religious man living 2,000 years ago, really know about life, particularly after all the discoveries that we have in our day and age at our disposal or at our, that we can access? It's a sort of superiority complex that we have as modern people. And I think it's probably more prevalent in the developed world, in the West. Because we not only look uh, at the ancients with this sort of uh, superior attitude, but we also look at the underdeveloped world with the same uh, superior uh, vantage point. And I guess that's why there's a lot of uh, uh, anger in some of the underdeveloped countries uh, about the, the way they are pa patronised. But nevertheless, it's a human being since, I suppose, the Enlightenment particularly have said, thank you God, you've brought us thus far, we can take from here, we don't need you anymore. Yes, some progress has been made, much progress has been made. In fact, uh, amazing breakthroughs in science and technology and medicine have taken place since our Lord walked this earth. Take a simple example, uh, early in the 20th century, the discovery of penicillin. I'm sure it wouldn't be uh, wrong of me to say that millions of people uh, have had their lives saved because of that discovery or, or extended. Uh, something as simple as that, that's an obvious example. But of all the discoveries uh, and progress being used to save lives, clearly not. And there are some blatant examples that come to mind. Weapons of war come to mind. Remember in the first Gulf War, let alone the second, remember how the ships were spewing off these missiles from off the coast uh, in, in, to inland targets. Some of these uh, missiles had the capability of pinpointing the targets, but not all of them. And just one of those missiles could really level this whole block. Extraordinary power to destroy life, to destroy property. Uh, and just take the simple gun too. Imagine uh, the USA without uh, automatic weapons so freely available. Uh, I know it's not as simple as that, but uh, some terrible things have been uh, done there because of the availability of guns. 
Africa too. Uh, wouldn't Africa be a different place without guns? I was there a couple of years ago and we were speaking to a missionary woman and she was friends with, um, well, she was familiar with uh, an elderly missionary woman and her daughter who had been shot and killed only a few months earlier simply because uh, the local gang wanted to take the car. And she concluded by saying there are too many guns in Africa. But uh, taking of life is not always so overtly violent. Uh, and so and we've heard that today too, some of the fantastic uh, things we can do with prenatal testing, uh, uh, such as am amniocentesis and uh, an ultrasound. Imagine if you showed one of those three-dimensional ultrasound images to people in Jesus' time. They'd be blown away by that. That's amazing technology, but it's not always used for, for good. Sometimes information uh, is, uh, leads us to make decisions that take life. I want to share an example of that. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, she had uh, one such test probably early in the... Uh, would it be into the second trimester of her pregnancy? Possibly. Uh, and uh, it was discovered that her uh, unborn baby had a severe case of Downs. And she spoke this over with her husband and they decided that they would abort the baby. They thought that they would be, they'd been kind to the baby. Uh, they would save it a lot of trouble and they would save burden on the family too, some of the things we've heard today. But uh, she deeply regrets that decision and it affects me profoundly too because I was there at the time offering partial care and uh, not an easy thing to recall. But not only did she have to deal with the, the grief of uh, the, the, I was going to say the loss of her little girl, but it was a, an act of death, uh, the taking of the life of her little girl. But not only that, the grief, but the, uh, the enormous and ongoing guilt that she carries in her life as a result. And she's an extraordinarily lovely person. She's thrown her energy into caring for her subsequent two children that she's had. Her, her occupation is one of care for people. And it's almost as if she's, I mean, by nature she's a caring person, but she's trying to, uh, to make up for the abortion by caring at, a, at an extraordinary level and showing benevolence in every uh, part of her life. We have come a long way. We have shown that we have an extraordinary ability to save life, uh, to manipulate life, and we have the drive to do so. We have the extraordinary ability to destroy life, and we have the drive to do so. At the heart of both of these is essentially the urge in human beings to want to control life, to be to become God, basically, to play God. And you think right back to um, Genesis, uh, where Eve wanted to be like God. And we think of sinister examples, Nazi Germany, experimentation on human beings. We think of what is happening in North Korea, but we've learned today that right in our own backyard, uh, we want to play God. We have birth control, death control. We uh, heard things like Emily's List, uh, disturbing. We heard about hybrids and uh, artificial gametes. Uh, quite bizarre, some of the things that uh, I listened to this morning. And often these things are under the guise of good. Proponents of euthanasia would claim that uh, uh, it's for a, a seemingly good purpose, uh, for the freedom of the individual, for starters, uh, out of compassion and uh, out of a sense of progress. Back to our Lord Jesus, though. He pointed to himself as the exclusive way, the truth, and the life. And the, uh, the frantic desire to, uh, to assert self-rule in the human being is very deceptive. And Satan harnesses that desire. He only wants to steal and kill and destroy, as Jesus said when he was saying, I am the good shepherd. 2,000 years after Jesus spoke these words, the world isn't exactly a, a, a trouble-free environment. Meanwhile, nevertheless, the one true God, the source of all life, uh, has an overarching plan. Despite uh, our confusion and our d desire to play God and our tendency to get it wrong and make a real mess of creation, He has an overarching plan that is all about life. Both life and death are are God's jurisdiction, His territory. And that's why we are here. The Holy Spirit, remember we confess the Holy Spirit as the Lord and giver of life, has 
told you through the good news about Jesus Christ and put not only the life of Christ in you, but put some sort of conviction in your hearts and, and give you a conscience and a desire to preserve life and express its sanctity too. That's why we're here. And our Lord Jesus Christ gave that life at the cost of his own life on the cross. We sang about the cross this morning. Jesus Christ not only taught ethics, and he did that very well and very strongly and very unapologetically and shockingly, uh, but he came for an even deeper purpose. He came to give abundant life. Uh, primarily and most importantly, he gives eternal life, uh, life everlasting, the resurrection and the life is Jesus Christ. I only wish people like Patrick Swayze had had a chance to hear this good news. Maybe he did. Or Christian Rossiter, was that the chap you spoke about? I think I saw in the news the other day, he's died. Yeah, I only wish that he had the wonderful consolation of the gospel in his last days or hours. But not only that primary gift, also the gift of forgiveness here and now. Forgiveness of sins to free people who are pursued by a shadow of, of, of guilt and shame and self-blame, like the friend I shared with you before. Uh, abundant opportunity to uh, break free from this guilt, this, that claws onto us from the past, and to live in the healing light of the Gospel and a clear conscience once again. How does our Lord give this to us? Well, we hear it like a cliche, but through the means of grace, through baptism where we become one with Jesus Christ, one with Him in His death, one with Him in His resurrection, uh, uh, ongoing, fed through His Word and through the sacrament of Holy Communion, uh, but also one that doesn't get much attention, but I want to share with you now in conclusion. Also, we deliver this life into the world through you people. You are Christians, little Christs. And so as Christ came as the ultimate life giver, he has given you that life and he's given it to you not just to, uh, to hoard but to share. And I believe that's also why you are here today. So peace be with you all.